Some of the main themes on Christmas is the fact that Jesus is our Savior, Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is a King. We've been singing about all that, right? Savior, Son of God, and King. And the text we're going to be looking at today focuses on those three things as well. 22 days. Who's counting the days down to Christmas? Anybody? 22 days. December 1st, um, Scrooge in the pulpit right here. (laughs) Went out with his wife, Cheryl, and got a Christmas tree. December 1st. I can't go on the computer without seeing all of these 12 days of Amazon till Christmas, you know, to all these sales I'm getting bombarded. I feel like Charlie Brown, you know, in that Charlie Brown Christmas where the commercialism of Christmas is weighing you down. Anybody feel that? Let's focus on the real meaning of Christmas, the Christmas story. Hey, next Saturday night, we're going to have our children do what's called a Christmas country spelling bee or something like that. But it's right here in the sanctuary Saturday night at 6.30. There you go. I forgot the time. So you told me. 6.30. Come. It'll be a joy to see the children really tell us all about Christmas. I titled the sermon... Gabriel's second announcement. Now, as a quick review from last week, we saw that Luke is the writer of this gospel. He's a, he's a Gentile. He's non-Jewish. He's a physician. He's a doctor. And he wrote an account of the life of Jesus that he wanted to give to a man named Theophilus, who's a person of rank. Oh, excellent Theophilus. His name means friend of God. And last week we saw that God sent an angel named Gabriel to an old priest announcing that his wife would bear a son whom they were to name John. Gabriel goes on to say about John that he will be great, filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, and that he would turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And that John was going to be the promised forerunner of the Messiah. In verse 17, it says, he will go before him to fulfill Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, that prophecy where it says, behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. But Zacharias, he kind of doubted Gabriel's words. And so what did Gabriel do to him? Struck him dumb. You will not be able to speak until these things take place. That was all last week. Now let's look at the second act of the Christmas story. At the conclusion of last week, I told you that I see the Christmas story in five acts. Last week was act number one. This week is act, act number two. So if you're in your Bibles, in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, if you don't have a Bible, please grab one in the seat in front of you. I want you to look at God's Word. Turn to the back to page 43, and you'll find Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? 
The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Would you join me in prayer? Father, as we look at this text of Scripture in Luke, of the angel speaking with Mary, we've heard this story many times. And yet we're asked, I'm going to ask that you would open our eyes even more, not only to the meaning, but to the application of this text for us. So through the power of the Spirit, speak through me, and may the Holy Spirit work through each one of us as we contemplate the meaning of this text. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Gabriel's second announcement. This is the second act of the Christmas story. Did you notice as I read this, most of this passage is dialogue. Very little is the narrator, Luke, speaking narration. But where he does is where he presents the two characters in this second act, verses 26 and 27. So let's look at the two characters of the second act. The first character, again, is the angel Gabriel. Gabriel's name means man of God. He's not a man, but he looks like a man. How many angels have wings? Except for Clarence in A Wonderful Life, when he hears the bell, then he got his wings, okay? Don't take your theology from movies. Gabriel, man of God. Now, we saw his first mission, that was last week, with the first announcement to the man Zacharias, the priest. But his job, it told us in verse 19, is to stand before God. He serves God. He goes where God sends him. And now, he's on a second mission for God. It tells us right there, in verse 26, in the sixth month. The sixth month of what? The sixth month of what happened with the first mission, getting the news that Elizabeth would bear a child. If you look at the end of verse 36, you can see it says, she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. So six months have gone by between the two missions. The first mission happened six months previously, and now the second mission happened six months later, and he's sent to a city. Actually, the word is polis, could be city or, or town. We think of Nazareth as a town. He's sent to Nazareth. Now, was Nazareth the center of Judaism, the religion of the Jews? Is Nazareth the center place? What is the center place? Jerusalem. Okay, let's look where Nazareth is on a map. The big body of water on the left is the Mediterranean Sea. The little body that's uh, one-third down in the middle is called the Sea of Galilee. It's actually a lake. It's seven miles wide and about 10 or 11 miles long. There's a river that connects the Sea of Galilee down to what's called the Dead Sea or the Sea of Salt. No fish can live in there. It's so salty. That's the Jordan River that flows between the two. There is a great descent as you go from the Sea of Galilee down to the Salt Sea. Now, if you look at the Dead Sea, you can see right to the left of it is the place called, the region called Judea. Jerusalem is in Judea. The temple is in Jerusalem. The center place of the Jewish religion is in Jerusalem in the area of Judea or Judah. Now, up by the Sea of Galilee is the region called Galilee. That's the Galilean region. And if you can see at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, to the left, you can see the town of Nazareth. 
Nazareth is right there on the edge of what's called the Big Valley or the Jezreel Valley or the Valley of Megiddo. Now, Nazareth is a small town. It's not a big town. It's built up today, but back then it was a smaller town. Nazareth is not known as being the hub of Judaism. In fact, when Philip comes to Nathaniel and says, Guess what? Guess what? We found him. We found him. We found the Messiah. We found the one that the law and the prophets point to. It's Jesus of Nazareth. In John chapter 1, Nathaniel says, what? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? In other words, it's... (laughs) People held Nazareth with disdain. Well, I got to visit Nazareth in 2012 when many from our church went on a tour of Israel. And here's a picture of Nazareth. It's taken from uh, one of the mounds just outside of Nazareth. You can see it was a cloudy day. I couldn't pick the weather. We just go and whatever comes, comes. And it just happened to be a very cloudy day. And so we're looking out from this little mound down a valley and then up on the hillside, you can see the town. The town is really built on the hillside. And the next picture is a picture of what's called the Church of the Annunciation. Annunciation meaning the announcement, Gabriel's announcement to Mary. So here's a church that they decided this is the location where the angels spoke with Mary, so let's build a church there. And so uh, the Catholics built the church there. And the inside of the church, it's very ornate uh, uh, decoration, and uh, lots of money was spent for that church. But anyway, it's supposed to be the place where Mary was hearing from Gabriel. The Church of the Annunciation. Now, the next picture, you can see me dead center. We had to wear orange hats so we never lose people in our tour. We all had these orange hats. I refused to wear it, so I'm holding it. (laughs) But you can see I'm standing on the edge of this little platform, and there's another uh, lady to my left who's standing on the very edge of what's like a cliff. You see, there's a big drop-off between where she's standing and where the Jezreel Valley is. Now, interestingly, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was preaching in his hometown of Nazareth, and they all of a sudden, the people didn't really like what he was speaking about. And so it says in Luke 4, 29, The people got up, drove him, drove Jesus out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. So it was kind of cool knowing that passage and standing on what could have been like the cliff where they led Jesus to throw him down. Oh, by the way, did they throw him down? No, his time was not yet. And so he just walked right through the middle of them, went back about his business. Nazareth. That's just a little bit picture of what Nazareth looked like when we went to visit. The first character is the angel Gabriel. He's sent on another mission. He's sent to this town called Nazareth. He's sent by God to this town. For what purpose? To meet with a certain woman. And the character, second character of this story is Mary. Notice that the text emphasizes the fact that she is a virgin. It begins with the words in verse 27. He was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin. Second thing we're told is she's engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. And this man Joseph was of the descendants of David, meaning he was of the house or the lineage of King David the great Old Testament king. And the third thing it tells us in verse 27 is the virgin's name was Mary. Interestingly, the Greek for Mary is Mariam. There's an M on the end of it, Mariam. And, um, well, not sure why um, we say Mary instead of Miriam for her name, but we do. We call her Mary, Mariam. And so he goes to this woman named Mary. Now, virgin, 
It's a word that's used in the Greek parthenos, meaning that she is young, usually, unmarried girl with the implication that she has her virginity intact. Twice in verse 27, uses the word virgin. Young. We don't know how young, probably a teenager, late teens, but she's young. She's engaged to a man named Joseph. Engagement then is different from the engagement now. We can break off engagements pretty willy-nilly. Back then, it's called you're betrothed. You have a certain time period of betrothal where usually the man is out to build his house to bring his bride to the house. And when the house gets done, they have a ceremony and they consummate the, the marriage and they're married. Now, they were betrothed, meaning that they hadn't had the marriage, well, ceremony yet, But you couldn't get out of a betrothal without a certificate of divorce back in those days. That's how binding this was for the man and the woman. She is bound to Joseph, who's of the house of David. So Luke introduces the two characters to us in these verses, 26 through 27. And the beginning of 28, the last of the dialogue, it says, and coming in meaning that she was indoors when he then makes his appearance to her. The rest of this passage focuses on the dialogue of the two characters. It dominates this act. And Gabriel is the one who begins the conversation. Notice what he says. Verse 28. Greetings, favored one. Favored one, meaning that she has found favor with God. She has deserved God's grace or his kindness to be upon her. And he goes on to say the statement, the Lord is with you. It reminds me of the little book called Ruth in the Old Testament where this man Boaz from Bethlehem comes into his workers in the field and the first words out of, his how, out of his mouth are, the Lord be with you, the Lord be with you. And they said to him in return, the Lord bless you. It's kind of a greeting, the Lord is with you, the Lord be with you, is what Gabriel the angel says to Mary. 29. She's very perplexed. What does that mean, perplexed? The root of the word perplexed is the same word that's used back in verse 12 for the word troubled. Tyruso, troubled. That's why he says in verse 30, do not be afraid, because there's part of what he is saying, his appearance and how it's coming out, that's troubling to her, perplexing her. So it's not just the salutation, it's probably also this angelic appearance. Again, how many of you want to meet an angel? Oh yeah, me, me, me. She wondered what this greeting meant. And notice what he says. Do not be afraid. Calls her by name, for you have found favor with God. Gabriel calms Mary by saying, don't be afraid. He reiterates the fact that she's found favor with God. She is the favored one. Think about this. Through the line of David, the Messiah is to come through the line of David, and Mary's from the line of David. Joseph's also from the line of David. And now of all the women in the world, the angel says, God chose you. God's favored you. He chose Mary to be the instrument for his redemptive plan for salvation of man, that she was going to bring the Messiah into the world. She's the favored one. And then the text really focuses on the announcement that he is going to make first to Mary and then about Mary's son named Jesus. First to Mary. Three unexpected facts she's going to hear. You will conceive. Now, did Mary ever doubt that she would one day conceive? No, I think all girls growing up think one day I'm going to have a child. But here the angel saying, you will conceive. 
and you will bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. See, the Hebrew of the word Jesus is the word Yeshua, where we get the English word Joshua, and Yeshua means deliverer, savior. Jesus' own name means savior. You're going to name him savior. You're going to name him Jesus. And notice what Gabriel says about Jesus. Here's God's announcement about Jesus. First, he will be great. He will be great. Did we hear that before? Yeah, we heard that back for John the Baptist. If you go back to verse 15 of John the Baptist, for he will be great. It's the exact same construction. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. And now it's told of Jesus, he will be great. Who's the one who's great, the mother or the son? It's the son who is great. The mother's the favored one, but the son, he's the one, he will be great. Secondly, we see in that verse 32, he will be called the son of the most high. In the Old Testament, the Most High usually has the Most High God. El Elyon is the Hebrew of it, Most High God. So when it says you're going to be called the Son of the Most High, it's referring you're going to be the Son of God. The Son of God. And Gabriel really makes a connection between the Most High and God by the very next statement, which says, and the Lord God, meaning the Most High is the Lord God, and he will give this boy, this man, Jesus, the throne of his father, David. His forefather, his ancestor. He's from the line of David. And then it goes on to say, thirdly, he will reign over the house of Jacob. How long? Forever. He will be a king. He will be like David. His kingdom will have no end. It's an eternal kingdom. Now Isaiah, which we just had a series on that previously, Isaiah, 800 years previously, wrote about this birth when he writes in Isaiah 9, verse 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And notice verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. How long will this kingdom last? Forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Gabriel's message about Jesus is he'll be great, he'll be called the son of the most high, and he will reign. He is king. That's why we're singing songs about the fact he is king. Jesus is king. Now Mary asks a question in verse 34. How can this be since I am a virgin? What happened to the last person who questioned the angel? What happened to Zacharias? He was struck mute, right? Well, how is this question different from Zacharias' question in verse, if you go back to verse 18? Zacharias asks, how will I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Mary says, how can this be since I am a virgin? Are they similar? They're pretty similar. How is the question different? Well, Zacharias' question was expressed from the position of doubt. He doubted what the angel said. And Gabriel calls him out on that in verse 20 when Gabriel says, You shall be silent, unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe. 
He came from a position of doubt. He was unbelieving of the angel. Mary's question, although it's similar, is not based on unbelief, but was based out of bewilderment. Like, how is this even possible? She's puzzled by the process of how this could take place. And Gabriel then answers the process when he gives his answer. In verse 35, he explains the process for her conception. Gabriel answers Mary's question. And the first two clauses are, I know this is really boring to you, but it's Hebrew parallelism. It's the Holy Spirit and the power of the Most High go together, and then you have the verbal, will come upon you, will overshadow you. So when you put the two clauses together, we have the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The meaning is the same. God is the one who will super naturally implant God's holy seed in Mary without there being any kind of physical contact. And Gabriel says, here's the result. This holy child will be the son of God. Somebody came up to me in the commons area when we were having coffee and asked me, so what was Jesus' DNA like? <laughs> If God puts a seed into her, I mean, she's got her egg, right? And he puts a seed and it fertilizes and all that. What's his DNA look like? I said, that's a good question. <laughs> Do you know church history has been arguing this fact of Jesus all through the early hundreds of years, meaning how much is Jesus human and how much is he divine? And the answer is he is both human and divine. Jesus being born of Mary makes him human, man, fully man. But Jesus coming from the seed of God makes him fully God. And so Jesus is both fully human and fully God. How? We're not going to know until we ask him how. All we know is he was God and he was man at the same time. Gabriel explains the process for the, her conception. And then Gabriel gives evidence of God's power by pointing to Elizabeth's current condition. You know, they didn't have phones back in those days. They didn't have uh, any way of contacting except for visiting or hearsay. Mary's unaware of her relative's condition until Gabriel points it out. Gabriel points out to her in verse 36, Behold, look, even your relative, your kinswoman, Elizabeth, has also conceived a son in her old age. And she, who was called barren, is now in her sixth month. He uses Mary's kinswoman as an example, God is powerful. Of which he then states in verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. How many things are impossible for God? Nothing, nothing will be impossible for God. So is it possible that two old people past childbearing age could conceive a child? Is that possible? Yes. Is it possible that a virgin who's never had sex with another human being could conceive a child without having any kind of physical contact? Is that possible? Yes. Possible. And the second act of the Christmas story ends when Mary humbly accepts God's plan. Notice what she says in verse 38. Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. She calls herself a bond slave of the Lord. The word doulos usually means uh, slave. Our English translations like to soften that by saying, We don't like the word slave, so let's use the word servant or handmaid. But the bottom line is, she's saying, I am willing to be a slave 
of the Lord. She's willing to be the one who serves the will of her master. Jesus is referred to as a doulos in Philippians 2 verse 7 when he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's the same word. He was a slave of God his father to do the father's bidding. Paul, the apostle Paul, almost in every one of the letters he writes, he refers to himself as a doulos. I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Here Mary is saying, the same thing. And she is willing to submit to God's plan, just as the angel outlined. She's willing to submit to God's plan. Do you think there was a cost to being pregnant, unmarried? Sure, there's a cost. When Mary conceived did Joseph know not at first but what happens when he does find out well you got to read Matthew chapter 1 he's very torn about this he loves her he doesn't want to disgrace her And so he's willing to divorce her, to put her away secretly, to, to say our, our betrothal is over. And that's when an angel of the Lord appears to him in a, a night dream, right? So when Mary submits to God's plan, there's a cost. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her when Joseph discovers she's pregnant. What's going to happen to her when her family finds out that she's pregnant? What's going to happen to her when the community, Nazareth, finds out that she's pregnant? Now, Nazareth was a very godly community. They would never gossip about an unwed pregnant teen. <laughs> Think of Mary. Who is going to believe that she is pregnant without her ever having had sex? Who, who's going to believe that? Who's going to believe that even though she's pregnant, technically she's still a virgin? Who's going to believe that? And who is going to believe the story that God's the one that made her conceive? No, really, an angel came to me. Who's going to believe? And when she becomes a mother of her firstborn son, what is she going to feel when people start to denigrate her son as being illegitimate? You think that's going to happen? It does happen. In John chapter 8, when Jesus is speaking with Jewish religious leaders, and they claim to be the children of Abraham, and Jesus says, well, that you need to be doing the deeds of your father, these Jewish leaders say to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. What are they pointing at? You were illegitimately born. They certainly didn't believe. See, there's a cost to submitting to God's plan. And so my question to you, which is the theme of this whole section is, would you, like Mary, obediently submit? Would you? Oh, sure we would. See, we, we know this story so well. It's very familiar to many of us here this morning. But would you really, like Mary, obediently submit to the Lord's will for your life? Two things I want to mention in closing. First, Gabriel's message about Jesus zeroes in on two main facts. The first fact is Jesus is the Son of God. 
That's pretty clear from the text, right? He is the son of the Most High. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and the power of God overshadows you, and for this reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. It's real clear Jesus is God's Son. The second major thing about his message is Jesus is King. He is the one who will reign over the house of Jacob forever. One day he will be sitting on the throne of his father, David, his ancestor, David, King David. Did that happen when Jesus came the first time? No, that's why we know he's what? He's coming again because he will sit on the throne of his father, David. The Apostle John writes in his gospel, the fourth gospel, he writes at the end of the gospel, not the total end, but in chapter 20, he writes these words in verse 31. John says about my gospel, these have been written so that you may what? It's all about belief. You may believe that Jesus, Yeshua, meaning Savior, is the what? Christ. Christ is the word Messiah. It's the anointed one. It's where we get the idea of he's going to reign. He's king. Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. Why did John write his gospel? So that you could put your faith and trust in the person named Jesus, who is the son of God, who is the king. Christmas is about Jesus coming to this earth as Savior, as King, as the Son of God. So the question right from that verse is, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and King? If not, will you do it this Christmas season? And secondly... Speaking to you who are Christ followers, Mary submitted to God's plan for her life even though it proved costly. So as Christ followers, are you still willing to be identified with Jesus? As your master, no matter the cost. So let's unpack that for a minute. If Jesus is king, is he master of your life? Is he master of your time? Your money? Your possessions? Is he master over your family? In other words, if he's really king, is he really master of you? And me. If Jesus is king, are you willing to go where the master sends? Are you willing to serve the master? You know, he's gifted you as his child. Are you serving him using those gifts? You know, if Jesus is king, are you willing to suffer ridicule for his name's sake? Do you think Mary ever heard the ridicule? Yeah, I think she did. Are you willing to be ostracized by people of this world just because you choose to be a follower of him? If Jesus is really king, are you taking your stand with Jesus regardless of the cost? See, we read Mary's response and we think, what a great, godly, submissive. Yeah, I'm the bond slave of the Lord. Be it done to me according to your word. What I'm asking myself and you as well, can you say that, behold, I am a bond slave of Christ Jesus? May it be done to me according to your will, O Lord. 
Isn't that what we really want to say? Isn't that the heart of this message? I'm the bond slave of Jesus Christ. May it be done to me according to your will, O Lord. So each one of us has a problem. It's called selfishness. We want to live our way. We want to do things our way. We don't really want a king. Let's be honest. We don't want somebody ruling our life. And yet the Christmas story is all about a savior has come, a king has come. We need to be like Mary. I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. May it be done to me according to your will, O Lord. Father, last week we learned about Gabriel coming to the man Zacharias in order to bring the forerunner of the Messiah into this world whose name was John. Today we're learning that Mary was going to be the bearer of a son and this son is the Messiah whose name is Jesus. Lord, it's our prayer that we would have the same kind of heart response that Mary had to the words of the angel, that we would see ourselves as slaves of Jesus Christ. He's our master. He's our king. And that we're here to do his will. Lord, many of us are rebelling against that idea. And we're asking that the Spirit of God would humble ourselves so that we would accept our purpose here on earth is to bring glory to Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.